myself to the stream. There I am, YouTube and uh, Facebook and link LinkedIn, LinkedIn, TikTok. Hey, I'm Brian Manning, and I'm a political asylum lawyer. My law firm is called Political Asylum Lawyers, and today I'm going to answer your questions about getting asylum in the United States. Okay, uh, I'm going to take your questions. Go ahead, start leaving them in the comments. Let me know in the comments what questions you have about winning asylum in the United States, okay? But before I get to your questions, by the way, say hello. Tell me uh, where you're watching from. Tell me what country you're from if you want. Um, and before I get to your questions, let me just say a couple words about something that keeps coming up. I keep seeing it in comments, on videos, about immigration, and people keep asking us this question, which is, okay, what is it? Which is it, Brian? When can I apply apply for my work permit based on my pending asylum application? Is it 150 days after I have applied for asylum or is it 180 days after I have applied for asylum? Uh, this is not a gray area. This is not a well, it depends sort of thing. There is a clear, very obvious answer that is 100% correct, okay? This is objective. This is not a subjective thing, but for some reason, a whole lot of people keep getting it wrong, including immigration lawyers. I even I see immigration lawyers get this wrong often, which is not surprising. Honestly, it's not that surprising because there's a lot of immigration lawyers who don't really know what they're doing, who um, don't take the time and put in the effort to really learn asylum law and the things that go with it. Like when can you apply for a work permit based on your pending asylum uh, application? So, um, Here's the answer. You can apply for a work permit 150 days after the government has accepted your asylum application. 150 days, 150 days, not 180. It is true that the government cannot actually grant your work permit application until 180 days have passed, but you can and should apply at 150 days after the government has accepted your asylum application and you should apply online by the way with USCIS not on paper okay it's faster it's better um, we got folks on YouTube and uh, Facebook and TikTok saying hello hello to all of you thank you for being here uh, I'm gonna get your leave your questions I'm gonna get your questions in just a minute um, and um, before I do though let me just say a tiny bit more about this question of 150 versus 180 days so I said that you can apply for your work permit sometimes referred to and formerly technically referred to as an employment authorization document. You'll hear people call it an EAD for the, the acronym for those uh, three letters, for first three letters of each word, employment authorization document, EAD, also known as a work permit. 150 days you can apply after having uh, applied for asylum. Let me rephrase that. Not after having applied for asylum, after the government accepts your asylum application. So let's say you mail, you put your asylum application in the mail or you upload it to the USCIS website on January 1st, we're not counting 150 days from then. We're counting 150 days from the date on the receipt notice from the government. What's the receipt notice? It is the letter that you get from USCIS that says, we have accepted and are processing your application for asylum. It is pending as of X date. That X date is the date where the clock counting 150 days starts. Okay. Um, and in the receipt notice from USCIS, it's like literally the first sentence of sort of the body of the letter. So not at the top where there's like data, like your name and A number and all that stuff, but rather a little bit below where it's like actually sentences. It's the first sentence that says your application is pending as of X date. That's the date where we start counting those 150 days that you need to get to, to be eligible to apply for your work permit. Okay. And it's a little bit different if you're applying for asylum in immigration court, you don't get the same letter. But um, you can you can get a stamped copy of your asylum application, or you can submit a copy, or at least the front, the first page of it. And when you submit it, they can stamp it with a received date to show you that it was received on a certain date, uh, on the date that it was received. Okay, and that's the date that you start counting the 150 days from. Okay, so if you apply online for asylum with my USCIS, that their their portal or their website through which you apply is called my USCIS. Okay. And if you do that, you might get the receipt notice the same day. Sometimes people get them the same day. Sometimes it's the next day or two days later. But usually it's very quick. As where if you send it by mail, by physical mail to USCIS, 
I post, then you're not going to get a receipt notice for many months. Probably we've been seeing it take like seven to 10 months recently if people apply by mail and that slows everything down. Don't do that. Apply online. If you're with USCIS, and if you're not in immigration court proceedings, that means the only place you can apply for asylum is with USCIS. And if you're applying with USCIS, outside of a few distinct circumstances, you can apply online. And if you can apply online, you should apply online. Okay? Um, that is what you should do. And the answer to the question is, yes, it's 150 days at which you can apply for your work permit. And then it usually takes the government... USCIS, one or two months to actually make a decision on it and then send you your work permit the first time around. When you're applying to renew your work permit that is based on your pending asylum case, it's taking much, much longer, like a year and a half. So that's frustrating to say the least. So um, that's how it works. But um, yeah, it, it, this is an important topic, right? Everyone, they, people need to work. People need to support themselves and their families. And they want to do it the right way. They want to get permission to work and do it legally. So this is a very important question, right? I get that. And I understand that's why people ask a lot of questions. They want to get certainty about this. And you're going to see online, if you go to TikTok or YouTube and you look up like asylum-based work permit, you're going to see comments and people, including lawyers, say you have to wait 180 days. That's not correct. It's not true. Those lawyers and notarios and form fillers and assistants or whatever, uh, are just not up to speed. They're just not, they're not current on USCIS policies. Okay. So hundred uh, percent positive that at the time I'm making this video, it's 150 days. All right. So that settles that it's definitive. The question has been answered. All right. Uh, green card guy says, Brian Manning is the asylum man to go with. He helps several of our clients get approved. That's my friend, John Ting. Uh, a great immigration lawyer in Houston, Texas. Thank you, Green Card Guys. Follow him on, on TikTok, Green Card Guys. Um, yeah, we've worked together on some cases. And and just two days ago, or was it yesterday? Two days ago, we got an approval for one a client that John had helped with something. We we, we took over his asylum case. Um, John was working on something else. We we helped him with asylum, and he won. We got his, we got his uh, asylum approval two days ago. We're super excited for him. In fact, he was on here on, on YouTube uh, on my last live a couple of days ago. If you're, if you're on here, say hello and uh, uh, tell us whether you're excited and happy about how things have gone recently for you in this regard, um, my friend. All right, let's go to the questions. Okay, after applying for a work permit, how long does it take? Uh, this is from Tiffany on TikTok. Um, first time around, if you're applying the first time based on your pending asylum case, it's quick. It's usually a month or two after you apply, okay? Uh, so yeah, that's good news. It's good. All right. Thanks for asking Tiffany. By the way, if you're watching this on TikTok and you want to get in touch with us, go to my profile. Okay. Click, click to go to my profile and you'll see the phone number for my law firm. And on Facebook and YouTube, it's right above my head and LinkedIn right above my head. Okay. It's that number you can call us. And what we'll do is we'll set up an asylum strategy session where you'll talk with one of our political asylum lawyers about your situation. And we'll tell you if we think we can help you. And if so, we'll explain exactly how, okay? We help people all over the country. We're based in Houston, Texas, but we have clients from coast to coast. Lots of, of course, lots of, as you would expect, lots of clients in Texas, but also we had a bunch of clients in California and Florida and New York and around Chicago and everywhere in between. So give us a call. It doesn't matter whether your case is with USCIS or an immigration judge in immigration court. It doesn't matter whether you've already applied uh, or you're thinking about applying in, in all those different phases. We, we help people. All right. So let's go um, to more questions. So that was TikTok. Um, uh, why, why is and TikTok, why is USCIS taking longer than the 150 days required by Congress to adjudicate OAW asylum applications? Uh, OAW refers to Operation Allies Welcome, and that is the name given to the program by which uh, Afghans were brought by the U.S. government to the United States in August of 2021 when the Taliban took over again. And um, yeah, so USCIS is supposed to have, there's a rule that says USCIS needs to be handling those cases in 150 days from the time they apply. It's, it's of course not happening. They are, they are going faster than other cases, I would say, in our experience but definitely not always 150 days. So, but to answer your question, why? It's USCIS. They just, they're overwhelmed. Their workload is intense. Um, 
it's a poorly run organization. I mean, the, the, the culture there is poor. Morale there is poor. There's just a lot of problems with that agency. And they just don't do good work usually. And they don't get things done in a timely fashion. So, I mean, you know, it's multiple things, but it's just, it's US, the answer is it's USCIS. It doesn't matter that Congress has told them they need to do it in a certain time. They just can't get it done. All right. Um, uh, when to apply for a green card? My asylum got approved last month, OAW. So that's another Afghan watching. Yeah, we, we've, we've done quite a few Afghan cases. Um, I'm familiar with the kind of cases that come from Af Afghanistan. I used to be a diplomat. So before I was, I'm an asylum lawyer now, right? But before I was an asylum lawyer, I was an asylum officer with USCIS. But before that, I was a diplomat. And in that capacity, I got to work on all kinds of interesting issues and was, of course, um, you know, keeping up with and, and working uh, to some extent with issues related to the things that were going on in Afghanistan through you know, for, the, for the last couple of decades, right? So, um, so I'm familiar, and as an asylum officer, I had cases from Afghanistan. And now as a lawyer, we have Afghan clients. So I'm familiar with the kind of cases that come from there and the, the challenges and the unique aspects of those cases. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you got your uh, asylum. So the question though was, when can they apply for a green card? Because remember, asylum lead, can lead to a green card, right? You get asylum and then you have to have a year of physical presence in the United States before you can be granted a green card based on your asylee status. However, just a few weeks ago, or I don't know, maybe two months ago now, USCIS announced a policy change by which now they're saying, okay, you don't have to wait a year to apply it. After having one asylum, you don't have to wait a full year to apply for your green card. However, they can't actually give you the green card unless you have a year of physical presence in the United States after having one asylum. What does that mean? Well, to answer your question, you can apply now if you want. You can apply the day after you win asylum. Why would you want to do that if you can't get the green card yet? Well, you be because you don't have a year of physical presence yet after having one asylum. Well, because you'd be getting your place in line. Right now it's taking like three years or over two and a half years on average for USCIS to adjudicate or to make a decision on these applications based on asylum, applications for a green card where the person has asylum. And so the idea is, well, if I apply now, even though I don't meet the physical presence requirement, I'll be getting my place in line ahead of those other people that would all be getting in front of me if I were to wait like a year until I actually applied. And then hopefully, you know, by the time they pick up my application and look at it and make a decision on it, by that time, you know, one, two, three years from now, by that time, I will have the physical presence requirement met for one year of physical presence in the United States after having one asylum. OK, so the risk, though, of applying early is that before one year is that they might actually pick it up and look at it and adjudicate it before you reach that one year mark in which case they might deny it and say, nope, you don't meet the physical presence requirement of one year after asylum. And so they might deny it. It's not the end of the world. You can apply again. It doesn't keep you from applying or keep you from getting it in the future. It's just that um, you would lo you know, you'd lose your, your application fee. At the moment, that's $1,225 for all the fees, but that's probably gonna go up in the coming months. Um, so you'd have to pay that again. You know, if you get if you apply now, they pick it up. They say nope, no physical presence requirement met, and they reject it. Then once you meet the physical presence requirement, you could apply again, but you'd have to pay the fee again. So that's the risk, which is not you know it's not a small amount of money. It's a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, in terms of trying to get the most stable immigration status as soon as you can and go as quickly as you can towards U.S. citizenship, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a risk in in that context. You know, all right. Um, Karim says, hello, Mr. Brian on YouTube. By the way, if you are watching on um, LinkedIn or TikTok, go to my YouTube channel, all right? It's, go to YouTube and search for Political Asylum Lawyers. That's the name of my law firm. And that's where I've got my best stuff, okay? The detailed trainings, I've got some, I've got some long, very detailed, in-depth, serious asylum trainings on there that I think are going to help you win your case, okay? They're going to help make your case stronger. Whether you're with Immigration Court or whether you're going to be at USCIS, whether you've already applied or not, there's lots of trainings and, and detailed videos on there on my YouTube channel called Political Asylum Lawyers that I believe will help you increase your chances for success in your asylum case. So go to Political Asylum Lawyers and subscribe. All right, this is a uh, Mabel says... 
they, they say American flag, USA, USA. Thank you for commenting. Um, on you, no, on Facebook, we've got a, a question, interesting question from Dimiana who says, is it okay if I have no story? So when you say no story, I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume you mean like you, there, nothing bad has happened to you and like nothing has happened that makes you think that you're going to be in danger in the future in your country. Um, no, it's not okay for, for trying to get asylum because to win asylum, you, there are some cases where you can win based just on things that have happened in the past, but you, in, in most cases, you have to show that you have a real risk of being persecuted, of being severely harmed in the future. And if you can't point to anything that shows that you're at great risk, then no, you won't win asylum. So, um, you know, well, it doesn't always have to be a direct threat to you, right? Like you can be, you can possess a certain characteristic that um, makes it such that just by virtue of being a person of this class, a person who is like this, who has this characteristic, just that puts you at great risk because in your country, they're persecuting people like that, like crazy. And so just being one of these people puts you at risk, but that would be your story. I mean, that's, when I say story, I don't, I, I don't mean like invented stuff. I mean, that would be your history or your, that would be the basis for your asylum claim is that you possess this characteristic, but you shouldn't make that up. You shouldn't, you shouldn't make up a story. Uh, I am against immigration fraud. And to be clear, making up a story would be immigration fraud. So no, it's not okay to not have a, um, a reason to be afraid. If, if nothing, if you've not been harmed and you don't have a reason to be, to think that you will be harmed in the, in the future, but there's at least a pretty good chance you'll be harmed in the future, then asylum is not for you. Um, and you, sh you shouldn't, you shouldn't apply for asylum in my opinion. Okay. You'll hear, you'll hear, you'll hear lawyers say otherwise. You'll hear lawyers that will just be like, oh, it's okay. We'll just make something up for you. Um, I don't do that. I prefer to, uh, try to be ethical and do the right thing, which to me is, um, you know, not, not lying. Um, so, you know, I, honesty is the best policy in my opinion. Okay. Um, I understand that people do things to uh, survive and to get by and to, and are having to deal with problems greater than what I could ever imagine probably. And so I don't judge someone for, decisions that they make under these very, very difficult circumstances. But I can tell you that I think that honesty is the best policy at the asylum office and, and immigration court. Okay. Um, just because I think it's the right thing to do, but also strategically, I think it's smarter to, to be honest and open and forthcoming. Okay. So that's what I think about that. Uh, but I wish you all the best. So Pella says, hello, Brian on YouTube, TikTok. What are you waiting for? Go over to YouTube, search for political asylum lawyers and subscribe. Okay. Um, so how did you get your, on TikTok, how do you get your social security number after you received your EAD card for pending asylum in the mail? Well, when you apply for your work permit, your EAD, based on your pending asylum case, there's a, a little box, or for, based on anything actually, there's a little box, one of the boxes says, like, do you want to also get a social security number, social security card? If you check yes, you have to fill out a few more questions about that. And as long as you do that, then when you send your, your work permit application, you're applying for both at the same time. And usually someone gets the work permit first in the mail. And then usually it's about two or three weeks later that they get their social security card in the mail with their social security number on it. If you get your work permit and like a month goes by and you have not gotten the social security card, then you're gonna have to follow up with the social security office. If you just Google social security administration near me, you can find a social security office near you that you can try to call or go to to ask about this about, hey, where's my social security card, okay? It's not something that USCIS will be able to help you with. Um, it's the Social Security Administration is what it's called, all right? Um, okay, so Damiana said, how long does it take to give me the work permit? I know that it should be asked for after 150 days, but when will it be accepted? Usually, it's, usually people in our experience have been getting the work permit card in the mail uh, one to two or two and a half months after applying. Okay. It's pretty fast, pretty fast. Not bad. All right. Um, uh, 
So um, Karim says, if your is your do your fingerprints should be should they be taken again before your individual hearing? If your asylum case was referred from USCIS and USCIS already took my fingerprints before an interview, thank you, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so as part of the affirmative asylum application process, when you apply with USCIS, you you have to go do your biometrics, right? Give your fingerprints, they take a photo, they ask you to sign something to record your signature. And as part of that, pro that's part of the process for USCIS asylum application, right? If your case gets referred, sent to immigration court because USCIS does not approve it and you don't have any other, any kind of legal immigration status th at that moment, then you get put in deportation proceedings, right? In immigration court. But there you have a second chance to explain your case before the judge and the judge decides. And so this question is, so I did my fingerprints for USCIS. Well, do I have to do them again Bef before my individual hearing, which is usually the second hearing in immigration court where you have to actually explain your case. And usually very often you get your decision the same day on that second hearing, the individual hearing. So do you have to do your fingerprints again? Well, um, if it's kind of, it, it's a little bit complicated, like um, you, the, the fingerprints can expire uh, after like 15 months. So if you did it a long time ago, which you might have, you might've done it years ago. They can be too old to use. However, usually the, the the office of the lawyers for the government for ICE who are trying to deport you, called the office of the principal legal advisor, these lawyers can refresh in some cases the fingerprints and basically like yeah refresh them, just like make them work again. But sometimes for some reasons they can't, and they're like, oh no, these aren't good. We ha you have to do it again. But if they haven't told you at like your first hearing or or since then haven't told you we need you to do your fingerprints again, then um, you you sh you should be okay. Like it's something that if you show up at the individual hearing, I don't think the judge is going to deny your case because you haven't done them again. I think that if they need to be done again, the judge will probably give you the chance to do it. But I got to tell you, I got to tell you, like we, with our clients, we want to play it safe. We want to play this conservatively and safe. And so we reach out before the individual hearing, we actually reach out to the lawyers for ICE and we say, oh, it looks like this, our client had their fingerprints done in whatever year, are, are those good? Can you guys still use those for the background checks that you need to do? Um, it, can you refresh them? If not, and you, and you need them to be taken again, let us know and we will request that USCIS schedule biometrics appointment again. So, so we reach out to the lawyer for our clients and ask about it. I mean, you could try, per, if, you, if you don't have a lawyer, you could try doing that yourself. Um, but, you know, I mean, in general, it's better, in my opinion, to have a lawyer. The success rates for people with a lawyer are much, much, much higher in immigration court. Okay. You should know that, Karim. Um, maybe we should talk. When is your hearing and where is it? I'd be curious to know if you want to share. If not, that's fine. Um, all right. Uh, in, uh, okay. This is interesting. On TikTok, we've got, we applied for asylum in 2015, 2015 and we got the interview in 2021 and we're still waiting on the decision. If you want to get your decision, you should sue the government, okay? Um, the government's supposed to act in a reasonable amount of time on any application for any immigration benefit, including asylum. And when they don't do that, you can sue them and ask a federal judge to tell them that um, the USCIS has to do its job. They have to finish your case. They have to give you a decision. Now, usually when I'm talking about suing the government, it's in the context of suing to get your asylum interview scheduled because there's, you know, um, uh, like 400,000 people, actually more, I think 500,000, waiting for their asylum interview to be scheduled. And if you've been waiting several years, you're in a good position to sue and use that mechanism to force the government to give you your interview. But you can also do it in your situation, okay? You can also do it um, when you're waiting for the decision after you've had your interview because it doesn't really change anything. The government still has not acted on your case like they should. It's not just, oh, the government needs to do something. No, the government needs to make a decision. They need to process your case, the whole thing. And if you don't have a decision, the case hasn't been processed. So you can sue them. And you've been waiting since 2015. What's that? Maybe eight years. Um, you are in a very good position to have success. If you sue, I, I believe that you have a very high chance of that working, of having success in the sense that it will force them to give you your decision very soon. So if you want to talk about it, give me a call on TikTok. Go over to my 
profile and the telephone numbers there, as well as a link that you can click on. And then you can click a, a link to schedule uh, directly with us uh, an asylum strategy session with one of our political asylum lawyers. So on TikTok, um, uh, I need assistance, please call us. Go to, go to my profile and schedule an asylum strategy session with one of our political asylum lawyers. That's where we'll discuss your situation, okay? Doesn't matter where you live. We have people all over the country. It doesn't matter if your case is with USCIS or immigration court, whether you've already applied or you're thinking about applying. We'll talk through it uh, with you and we'll tell you what we think in terms of whether we can help you. And if so, we'll, we're going to set forth exactly what we're going to do for you because we're going to do a lot. Most immigration lawyers, I've got to tell you, do virtually nothing. And I learned this when I was an asylum officer with the government. I was actually pretty shocked to see how little most immigration lawyers do to help their clients. In asylum cases, most of them, I, I learned, they just basically help them a little bit, fill out the form, and that's pretty much it. That's not enough, guys. That's not close to enough. There's so much more that you can do to present a strong case Okay, and to be ready to do a great job at your interview or at your court hearing. Okay, there's a lot that you can do um, that if a lawyer knows what they're doing and they're willing to put forth effort for their clients, there's a lot you can do to, to increase your chances for success. And we'll tell you all about that in an asylum strategy session. Just so just call us up here. Okay, uh, nice. My man, Badru on YouTube at the Political Asylum Lawyers channel says, Thanks, Mr. Brian, and your good team for helping me winning my asylum case on Monday after suing to get my interview scheduled. Asylum officer didn't act weird or ask me any questions related to suing. Um, so actually, for those of you that were on the beginning of this asylum answer show, uh, so we do help people sue the government. In this case, though, it was my friend John Ting and his law firm uh, who, who actually helped Badru uh, sue the government and and then we helped him like try to win his asylum case so it was a, it was a tag team my friend john by the way john's um his handle on tiktok is green card guys um and so anyway thank you badru for commenting yeah that was a good case and we're really glad that you won badru and badru is in the sec the bottom of the second part of his comment badru is saying the officer at the interview didn't act weird or say anything about suing because this is a really common concern right and it makes sense when I talk with people about, hey, you know what, you want to get your interview or you want to get your decision, sue the government. Um, they, they say, oh, but like, will that hurt my asylum case? Does it look too aggressive? Does it look like, you know, they're, like I'm, I'm fighting with the government and therefore they're going to punish me and give me a negative asylum decision or, or be mad at me and take it out on me in my asylum case? No, it doesn't. OK, it just doesn't work like that. There's a couple of reasons why I'm not going to go into great detail right now. I talk about this a lot, uh, but no, I don't think it's going to hurt your asylum case at all. And what Badr was, say, was saying in his comment was that, no, the officer didn't say anything about the fact that he had sued. The officer didn't act weird or treat him weird. OK, when I was an asylum officer with the government a few years ago, we didn't know that someone had sued. If someone sued or threatened to sue, that information about that did not go in the asylum case file. So when I did the interview, I didn't know if someone had sued, okay? I think it's still that way. I'm not positive, but I think it's still that way. Um, and, and so that's one thing is I don't think they know. Second thing is even if they do know, I don't think they care. Most of them probably don't care. They understand that uh, people wanna get on with their lives. They understand that people want certainty about their future in the United States. And so it's reasonable that someone would sue the government to assert their right. You know, you have a right to have under law to have the government take action in a reasonable time in your immigration case. And it's understandable that people would, would use this mechanism, this what's called a mandamus lawsuit to, to push their case forward, okay? So thank you for commenting, Badru. Good, uh, good to hear from you. All right, um, let's see. What else? Uh, nice, thank you. Uh, Guy says, Nicholas says, congrats, Badru. Good work, says Yalo. Um, interesting question from Sunil. Says, will Title 42 be lifted on May 11th, 2023? I don't know. There's a lot that can happen between now and then. Complicated subject. Um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, same thing about this, this question, about whether um, similar, well, 
also from Sunu. Whether the Biden new Biden Assam rule is going to be implemented in May 2023, the Biden administration has proposed some tough stuff, some stuff that is going to make it harder for a lot of people to get asylum. And the rules that they're proposing are not yet in effect, but they may come into effect. They might not. We'll see. I don't know. The answer to your question? I don't know. We'll see. Or they may come into effect for a minute and then get possibly blocked by a court. So, you know, the, a lot of what Biden wants to do is similar to what Trump did. And a lot of what Trump did got blocked by a federal judge who said, no, you can't do that. That's not legal. So if it happens, if it comes into effect, I hope that it will get blocked or at least m most of it will get blocked uh, by an immigration or by a federal judge. Badru, our uh, client said, also big thanks to Mr. Jacoby. That's my colleague, uh, Brian Jacoby Law, who is, or Lori, who is another lawyer with my law firm, Isabella, uh, also with my law firm, and then John Ting, my friend, uh, green card guys on TikTok, who is a lawyer in Houston. Uh, you're welcome. It's all our pleasure. Uh, all right. So, uh, Mr. So we've got a Turkish question, a, Tur a question from someone who sounds like they speak Turkish. I have a, my court after one month on Kurdish from Turkey and I make uh, asylum political. What do you think about Kurdish people from Turkey? Can they win the case? I mean, I know a little bit about the situation and yeah, like there, there's probably a chance that you can put together a strong case, but you got to understand it's not quite as simple as just like, oh, I'm from a place where, or I'm a person of a certain ethnicity or background or race from a certain place where those people are treated poorly. Therefore, I'm going to win asylum. It's not quite that easy. It's, it's complicated. Asylum is tough. The law is complicated and it's, it's hard to get. Okay. The approval rates are not high. Um, both in immigration court and at the asylum office, the approval rates are way less than 50%. Uh, according to the most recent statistics, the approval rate at the asylum office was, I think, 27%. In immigration court, I think it was like 35 or something percent, something in the 30s, a little bit better than asylum office, but not a lot. So it's tough, okay? But I mean, yeah, as a, an, uh, an ethnic Kurd in living in Turkey, sounds like there may be something there, but we would need to talk with you about it in, in a lot of detail to tell you whether we think you have a good chance. And if so, you know, or if you have a chance of winning, what we could do to help you. So give us a call on uh, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. My number's right above my head. On TikTok, go over to my profile and give us a call to schedule an asylum strategy session. Do it now, all right? Do it now. Um, Isa and uh, Isrif, sorry for the mispronunciations. I'm always following your videos. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. For those of you on TikTok and Facebook and LinkedIn, if you want detailed stuff and like all my best stuff, all my best tips, go to the YouTube channel. It's called Political Asylum Lawyers. That's where you're going to find that stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. So Kamran says, what kind of documents should an LGBT person show to the asylum officer to prove their sexual orientation? Something like a letter from a doctor. Yeah, it, it's it's really it's it's kind of weird and messed up that you have to do this, but you do have to convince the asylum officer or the judge that you are gay or um, something other than uh, heterosexual. If you're that's what your case is is based on, being what they call it USCIS a sexual minority, which basically means anyone who's anything any has any kind of orientation other than straight or indie. Um, uh, yeah, so um, that's. So yeah, you do the, 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 the question, the premise is correct that you do have to like convince them. So how do you do that? No, I wouldn't say a letter from a doctor. I don't, I don't think that is a good idea. But letters from other people, yeah. Like if you've ever had a partner of the same sex that would be willing to write about it, um, photos uh, of you um, doing things that quote unquote look gay. And it's, I know it sounds super weird, and it's unfortunate that that's how it is, but the more that you can show the officer or the judge things that they perceive as like looking gay, the better chances you have for success is the bottom line. Okay. Um, you know, so if you've been to pride parades, for example, um, or at a, you know, a club um, that's like mainly for uh, frequented by LGBTQ plus people, um, and it looks that way, then those kinds of things, those kinds of photos could be helpful. Okay. Uh, family members or friends, if you've come out to people, like some of the first people that you came out to and you talked to uh, about this too, letters from those people about that, con those conversations can be helpful. Okay. So what we do is 
we ask our clients a bunch of questions about their case, whether it's this kind of case. Um, thank you for asking the questions, by the way. Whether it's, no matter what kind of case it is, we ask them a bunch of questions, a ton of questions. And then based on this, on their answers and what we know about their case, we make a list of all the different kinds of evidence that we think they should get, a detailed list. We say, try to get as much of this as you can, okay? So if you if you wanted our help, uh, was it Kamran? Yeah, Kamran, after we learn about your case, we would make a list for you saying, get A, B, C, D, E, F, G, okay? And you would try to get as much as you can. You know, you, you probably wouldn't be able to get all of it, but um, as much as you can, okay? So, nice, oh, nice. Um, all right, I'm a lawyer in the Middle East. Uh, I didn't see the rest of your comments. Someone on TikTok says, I'm a, law a lawyer in the Middle East. Um, yeah, we didn't see if you had a question. Interesting. Uh, all right. Uh, how long does the process of PD take in immigration court? PD is a reference to prosecutorial discretion, probably in this case, what the person is asking about on TikTok is uh, probably trying to get their case dismissed from immigration court, where in, under certain circumstances, the lawyers for ICE, who normally are trying to deport people, will say, you know what, this case isn't a priority. Actually, we don't mind if this person stays. We're not, we don't really need to deport them that bad. So judge, we're okay if you dismiss this case. And um, if the judge agrees, which usually they do, if the, if the ICE lawyers want it to be dismissed, usually the judge says yes, then the case just goes away. It like disappears. But your asylum application disappears with it. Like it doesn't, you don't have an asylum case pending. So you can't get asylum. There's some question as to whether you can apply again with USCIS. We've, we've, we've done that with some of our clients, um, but it's unclear how USCIS is going to treat the one-year filing deadline issue. Uh, so we'll see. The point is it's kind of complicated. Uh, but anyway, there, there's downsides and upsides to getting your case dismissed. The upside, the good thing is that like you're not um, going to get an order of deportation anytime soon. You're not, you're not, um, you know, one step away from getting a deportation order, which is where you are if you're in immigration court proceedings. So getting out of immigration court proceedings by way of having your case dismissed as an exercise of prosecutorial discretion by ICE can be a good thing. Um, but it's, it's, it's often a very tough decision as to whether that is something you want to do. So I recommend if you, if you are thinking you might want to get your case dismissed, or if ICE says, hey, we're willing to dismiss your case, or if the judge indicates they might want to get it dismissed, you should talk to an asylum lawyer and, and weigh, talk about your priorities and weigh your options because it can be tricky, okay? But the question, sorry, I rambled a bit there. The question was, how long does it take? So if you have asked ICE for, prosecutor, for, for them to agree to dismiss your case, to ask the judge to dismiss your case, uh, you're, there's a very good chance that you're not going to get an answer, hear back from them at all until very close to your hearing, like maybe a week or two before your individual hearing, because they're just overwhelmed with cases and they're focusing normally on like whatever is right in front of them in terms of like, you know, a week or two away individual hearings. So unfortunately, there's a good chance that you're going to, you're not going to hear anything from them at all until then. I mean, you can, if you've asked them, you can keep following up with them, you know, every few weeks, you could send them an email or call and be like, Hey, could you look into this? What's the status of this? Can we get this taken care of? Okay. Uh, where did that question go? Um, someone asked on YouTube, I think it was, can you have two lawyers? Who said that? Um, I'm not seeing it right now, but someone asked on YouTube, can you have two lawyers on your asylum case? I mean, yeah, it's possible. Some, sometimes lawyer, oh, here it is. Uzi says, hey, Brian, is it possible to hire two lawyers for your pending asylum case? I mean, in theory or in practice too, yeah, it's possible. There's no rules against it. Lawyers can, even from different law, from different law firms, can work together on an asylum case. We don't do it. Um, I just, I like the way that we do things. I think that our systems and processes and our people are great. And so I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Um, it was like, I wouldn't be like, okay, I'm going to collaborate with the lawyer you already have. It's just not, it's just not something that I'm interested in doing, but you can change, you know, if you want to change lawyers, you can always, you can always change whether your case is at USCIS or the immigration court, you can, you can change lawyers. Okay. If you want to, if you think someone else can represent you better and give you a better chance for asylum success, then you should. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you for commenting. 
All right. Uh, hey, if you want to talk with us about your situation and see if we might be able to help you, call us. The number on YouTube and Facebook is right above my head and LinkedIn. On TikTok, go to my profile page or click on my little my name and go to my profile and you'll see the phone number and a link you can use to directly schedule an appointment with us, an asylum strategy session with one of our asylum lawyers. Okay. Um, all right. U visa news says X where, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't do U visas. I don't focus on U visas. I, I really just focus on political asylum. We also can help with green cards for like family-based green card cases and for green cards for people who have gotten asylum, but I don't do, I don't do U visas. I really try to focus on asylum. All right. Um, so let me know if you have asylum questions. Um, all right. So Jorge says, by the way, Jorge, if you speak Spanish, um, I have a, a YouTube channel called Asilo Aprobado in Spanish that you can go check out. Asilo Aprobado. Search Asilo Aprobado where I talk in Spanish. Um, he says, thanks for the information. I'm waiting for the answer. The officer said, come back in 15 days. I did it. But when I was there, they said, I'll receive my letter by mail. Now it's one month and I haven't gotten it. In any response. Um, this happens kind of frequently. At the end of the asylum interview, the officer will tell you whether you need to come back in person to the asylum office to pick up your letter. And when they say that, usually it's two weeks. Uh, Jorge said it was 15 days. Usually it's like exactly two weeks, like 14 days, but uh, maybe in some cases 15 to come back and pick it up. Or alternatively, and usually for people that live far, very far away from the asylum office, they say, we're going to mail it to you. Don't come back. We're going to mail it to you. So they explain at your interview, which of those it's going to be pick up or mail out. So Jorge went back for a pickup, and when he got there, they said, oh, sorry, we don't have it ready for you. We'll send it to you in the mail. That's very frustrating. It's very annoying. Um, I'm sure that you were very frustrated with that. Um, sometimes the day before you're supposed to go or two or three days before, you get a call, and they say, oh, we're not going to have it ready yet, so we'll mail it to you, which is a bummer because once they tell you they're going to mail it to you, it takes pressure off of them to get it ready. Having a pickup uh, date, uh, a firm pickup date helps – for them to usually actually get it done. But sometimes they don't for, for various reasons. They just don't finish handling your case. Or hey, it doesn't mean anything bad. It doesn't mean that it's, you're not going to win. It doesn't mean anything negative necessarily. It, it, there can be lots of reasons why they just don't finish it in time. But it is unfortunate because now th there's not as much pressure on them to like do it soon. And, you know, it's been over a month, Jorge said. So when is it going to happen? I don't know. Unfortunately, I don't know. It, it could be, it could be quite a while. Could be, could be several more weeks. Could be months. Could be even longer. If you've been waiting, if you applied for asylum like more than three years ago, and you're tired of waiting, then you could consider suing or threatening to sue at least. Okay, um, to get your decision. All right. Yep. You bet. Thank you for the, for the comment. Uh, so. Elaine or Elaine says on YouTube, how often do they review approved asylum cases to make sure it's still valid after approval? So I think Elaine is asking, do they go back and like reassess the case and say, hmm, does this person really still need asylum? Or like maybe they, she's asking, I don't know, maybe you're asking like, do they go back and check and like look at it closer and see, hmm, is everything correct? Or did this person maybe lie to us? Um, in any event, they don't normally, the asylum office usually does not go back and reassess cases where they've granted asylum. However, when you go further in your immigration journey and you go and you apply for a green card um, and then later for citizenship, sometimes at those stages, the people adjudicated looking at those cases for USCIS, they do sometimes look, in, look at things and think, oh, it looks like they might have lied to get their asylum. Like if they see something in your application for your green card that is different than what you said in your in your asylum application or that you said at your interview, because they do see the notes that the officer is typing, the officer is taking during the asylum interview. They, officers for USCIS can see that later when you apply for your green card and for your citizenship. And so if there's something that doesn't line up or if they just get other information about you, for example, after you get asylum, if you travel back to your home country um, and then you come back to the United States, this you might not get let back in at the airport. But if you do, 
and like they just yeah if you, if you do you get let back in and then you go apply for your green card they might see oh i see you left the country where did you go oh you went back to your home country oh well that makes me think that you were never really afraid of being harmed if you were you wouldn't go back to your country and so therefore uh, what they do is they send the the field office that adjudicates the green card can send the case back to the asylum office and recommend that the asylum office do an interview with you to determine whether you whether they should strip your asylum status from you okay and it happens it happens i've um i've, I've handled these okay as a lawyer and it's hard to win once once uscis says says oh we're going to send your case your we're, we're, we're going to make you do another interview at the asylum office to assess whether to take away your asylum status it's hard to win usually they take it away um so you get you get interviewed again at the asylum office and then the officer can say i'm stripping away your asylum and then they if you don't have any other status they send you to immigration court where you're in deportation proceedings and it's you kind of get a second chance there but like not really to keep to argue about it so it's tricky so the answer is it, but the, the answer is it doesn't happen often like they don't they don't go out of their way to say oh let's find a country where things have gotten better and therefore now the person doesn't really need asylum because the thing that they were worried about is not existent anymore because there's a new government in power or something like that. That doesn't really happen. I wouldn't worry about that kind of thing if I were you. But if you lied or something in your application or in your interview, um, I would worry about it. Yeah, it could happen. Or if you go back to your country after having gotten asylum, that can be another thing that definitely can cause you to possibly lose your asylum status. Okay, so I hope that helps, Elaine. Uh, thank you for, for the interesting question. All right, Deborah on YouTube at the Political Asylum Lawyers channel says, my asylum is pending and no future date. Am I still going to court? Um, yeah, eventually. They'll, so, you know, when you're in immigration court, you, you can check your case status online through the court's website, or you can call the immigration court and use your A number to uh, see what the case status is. And it, it, it will either say, you know, your next hearing is like, your, your master calendar hearing is on X date at this place, or your individual hearing is on X date at that place, at some place. Or it can say like, uh, what does it say? No hearing scheduled, um, something like that. And so Deborah's asking like, well, what does that, I guess you're asking, what does that mean? And like, am I, am I eventually going to go to court? Yes. Eventually, they just haven't scheduled a hearing for you yet. When are they going to schedule a hearing for you? There's no way to know. It could be soon. It could be months or even years. Okay. Unfortunately, there's no way to know when they'll schedule it. And then, and there's also no way to know like what the time frame will be for the actual hearing itself. It could take two years before they schedule something. And then it could be scheduled for another two years out. It just depends on, there's various factors, but it mainly depends on the judge that you're assigned to and that judge's calendar, their schedule and their availability. Okay. Um, wait, uh, okay. Um, Scott McCall says on YouTube, Hey, I'm from Boston. My, my asylum was granted. How long will it take to bring my wife here? So if your wife is overseas and you have one asylum, you can petition to bring her here, uh, through the I-730 process. That's the name of the form that you, that you use to apply to bring your spouse or children who are both they have to be under 21 and unmarried. Well, they have to have been under 21 when you applied for asylum. And they have to still be unmarried like now when you're bringing them over. That's the form called I-730 that you use to bring them over. I checked a couple of weeks ago and the processing time for this form on average was, I think it was 18 months, a like year and a half. So it takes a while. We recently had success getting this done much faster. We got it expedited because our client's family was in danger overseas. So you can ask, to expedite based on urgent humanitarian concerns, just like you can ask to have your asylum interview at the asylum office expedited because of urgent humanitarian issues. So if that happens, if they grant your expedite request, it's still gonna be a few months. It's still gonna be at least a few months to go through the process of getting USC of applying, getting USCIS to approve your I-730 and then arranging for your family to go to a visa, to go to an interview at the US embassy or consulate where, they're, where they are and to get that travel document to come to the United States. So it's, it's gonna be several months is the bottom line, but probably like a year and a half or two years, unfortunately. It's tough. I know I'm sure that's really, really tough. So I'm sorry 
Scott, that you're in this difficult position by being uh, you know, separated, okay? Um, all right, let's see. Um, <laughs> that's interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, why does it take so long? Uh, Agadarog says, why does it take so long to get an interview or a decision after an asylum interview? As I was saying earlier, everything is hard with USCIS. They're just overwhelmed. They have too much work. The asylum officer job is hard. Okay. I was an asylum officer. I can tell you it is a stressful, difficult job and you're overwhelmed. The workload is very intense. Uh, and they just don't have enough resources. It's hard. It's hard. And there's just not a well-run agency. So the, the important thing to remember is that it doesn't necessarily mean something bad about your case. The fact that it's taking a long time to get the interview, okay. Or excuse me, to get a decision after the interview, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Okay. Uh, it doesn't mean like, Oh, I'm going to get denied because it's taking a long time. So that's, that's, that's the good news I have for you. The bad news is I don't know when it's going to, you're going to get it. Um, but, um, I hope it's soon for you. All right. That's it for today. Uh, thank you for joining me on the Asylum Answer Show. I'm Brian Manning, and uh, it's really an honor to serve you in your asylum journey. Give us a call. Schedule an asylum strategy session with us, okay? YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. Check out this number above my head. Call it and schedule an asylum strategy session now, all right? And take that, go to my profile and uh, check out the number and give us a call. And we would love to talk with you and see if we think we can help you, Okay. So uh, we'll be live again on Friday, probably about 3 p.m. U.S. Central Time. So I hope that you'll join me and let me know what questions you have about asylum. All right. Give us a call, though, in the meantime, and let's let's get serious about your case and, and get it going or, or apply uh, or get ready to, to do the best job you can to present the strongest case possible so that you can win asylum and secure your future in America. OK, that's what we love doing for people. So call us. OK. All right, guys, thank you and um, be in touch. Bye, guys. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Thank you.